Hi, I'm Dr. Cindy Dupuy. I have a PhD in learning disabilities. Uh, I do diagnostic evaluations, a little bit of intervention, a little bit of advocacy, and I'm also an adult with dyslexia and dysgraphia. And Kim with her giant mug of coffee today. Again. I'm a reading and writing remediation specialist. I've worked with kids with dyslexia, dysgraphia, ADHD, and other challenges uh, for the last 15 years, um, kindergarten through college. And I think you've been, once again, I think we need to go back and actually do your calculation because you've been doing a lot longer than 15 Oh, years. have I? Okay. I forgot. Yeah, that's okay. But, you know, you you lose track. It didn't occur to me that I've been doing this for more than a quarter of a century until recently, <laughs> which is kind of mind boggling, right? If I, if I think about it, including graduate school. All right. So enough digressing. Let's talk about a high and low set of scores on verbal comprehension. Okay, so on the WISC, you have a verbal comprehension score, and there's two main subtests that they use. There's actually four available, but there's two main sub ones that we use. One is similarities, and one is vocabulary. Now, Kim, I know you know what vocabulary is, so what's the vocabulary subtest? Um, and are you doing this all orally? It's not reading. Okay, so you're, I think you're giving, um, you're orally presenting a word. Yeah, and I, I'm guessing that you're, are you giving it in a sentence or you're just asking for them to give it in a sentence? You're just saying, what does this word mean? Yes. Okay, just plain and simple. Yeah, and there are words in there that have multiple meanings. Do they get extra points if they give multiple meanings? Absolutely not. So they, as long as they give one, they got it. As long as they give a definition with enough depth, they get maximum points. Now there's multiple points available, mm -hmm. okay? And if your answer is not precise enough, in the manual, after certain answers, there's a letter Q, and Q means query. And so I, as a clinician, let's, let's pick a random word. Let's pick a word dog. And if you said furry, I would mm -hmm. then come in and say, tell me more about that. Because there are lots of things that are furry, from a stuffed animal to a sheep, Mm -hmm. to mold it growing in your refrigerator right so and by so you by you giving them um additional query it allows them to access in their brain a more precise definition so you say tell me more about that and what might you say um oh uh people have them as pets and they have four legs and they go woof woof and okay at that point, you've given me enough detail that typically that would be considered a two-point response. Okay. If two you point. said legs and tail, that might also get another query or that might just get, uh, you're done, okay? And you, unless you're, unless you're qualified to administer the test, you don't get to know the nuts and bolts behind how the different answers work how many points you get, why certain questions get queried, or why certain responses get queried, and why others don't. Okay. Maybe so you, you get mad at me for asking this question. But if you have a person with expressive language difficulties, this would also impact your <laughs> your your score on verbal comprehension. Do you guys get that? Yes. Well, let's talk about that. So an oral expressive language disorder. Um, so there's there's Dr. Doris Johnson would say there's two kinds of oral language disorders. There is an expressive oral language disorder and there is a mixed receptive expressive language disorder. Ah. Because if you have a listening comprehension issue, you're also going to have an oral expression issue because you have to listen before you learn to speak, okay? So if we go back to this vocabulary subtest and I give you a word and you have a hard time finding the words and you talk around it, and you can't give me the precision, even though I, as a clinician, suspect that you know what it is and that you know what the word is, I can't then give you credit for it. And this is that makes so, sense. Yes. And, and this happens all the time at school and people, it happens with difficulty with written expression. You can maybe verbally express it, but you can't write it. So a lot of people don't understand these are, Cindy taught me these are all connected listening, writing expressing, I, I did it in the wrong order, but. Yeah, so we learn to listen to words first, then we learn to speak words, then we learn to read words, which is like listening to words, and then we learn to write words, which is like speaking words, but we add the graphene component. So um, 
Okay, so on the vocabulary test, there could be a bunch of reasons that you don't do well. One is I don't know how to express my ideas. Can you think of another reason that a kid might have difficulty on the vocabulary test? Uh, word retrieval or retrieval. Okay, so that's still an expressive language issue. I can't find the words that I'm looking for. I can't use a precision. Mm -hmm. um, so we oh. do this frequently where I say, do these two words sound the same? Put, mm -hmm. pet, or- Oh, are um, you talking about auditory processing issues? Yeah, or they're not hearing the word distinctly enough and they're not recognizing the differences in the words. And there are several words on many of the vocabulary tests, because vocabulary tests are not just unique to the Weschler scales, where kids mishear words, there's no other support for it. So the clinician is then supposed to go back and say, listen carefully and repeat the word again. But we've had lots of kids. I mean, my favorite one is kids that think consonant means large land masses on the earth of which there's seven. Yeah, continent, continent, continent. And con Continent means any letters in the alphabet other than you a, just I mixed do. It. You just mixed it. Consonant. No, that's what kids will do. Yes. They will think a consonant is a large landmass and a continent is the any letters in the alphabet other than a vowel. Or they won't know what a consonant is. That happens well. Yeah, we can go <laughs> in great depth on that, but we won't. Okay, so if you mishear the words then you don't provide an appropriate response. I also have kids that when you query, they're like, I don't know, or I don't have anything else. I will often sit and wait for kids. Now, have you ever noticed that if you say nothing in a conversation, it becomes uncomfortable and so somebody will respond with something? Yes. So I'm not there to make a kid uncomfortable, but I'm there to give them adequate wait time. And often when I give kids enough time to think, think and be relaxed, I will get a much more verbose answer. Um, can you imagine what would happen in a situation where you got a lot of kids to rack through quickly? You can't. It's too, it's too disruptive. Right. So they will just kind of move forward. They didn't respond. We're just going to go forward. And so you may not actually elicit or get their full response to know what they're truly capable of. Can I clarify a word you used for parents? Um, sure. You said mishear. So mishear, some people might think of that as not hearing it right. But what you're really saying is the connection between the symbol sound. Discriminating. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it's not recognizing the differences in sounds. Um, I have kids all the time that don't hear the difference between s and z. Right. Even if you over enunciate it, they yes. can't hear that difference. And so we literally have to go back and train them in that. Yeah. So this is linguistic. This is the linguistic. Dyslexia. Yeah. It's linguistic. And if, yeah. I mean, I have kids that are very angry at me in high school because they think an ornament is an ordament. The N and D sound are made in the same part of the mouth, but they heard it differently when they were little and they refuse to believe it's not an ordament. Yes. So it's when not I, hearing, it's... Right. It's, it's, so when we hear sounds, it goes to lower brainstem and then it goes up into your brain and it doesn't have to do necessarily with, it can, um, which is why we always say, hey, if a kid is mishearing words, you need to go get an auditory assessment. And if they still make those mistakes, that's when we say, hey, you know, you need to go do a an assessment for an auditory processing disorder, otherwise previously known as a central auditory processing disorder, so CAPD or APD. Um, but it is, you have to dig deeper. And we're going to take a pause here for just a second. We'll be right back. You heard it. So, sorry, we were checking to make sure that you couldn't hear any background noise. So, Kim, we were just talking about the fact that you said... There can be lots of reasons that kids mishear. And what was one of those reasons? Well, it's not necessarily an auditory processing disorder or a hearing disorder. Sometimes a lot of parents don't realize in that early time of development, what is it, baby through three years, if your kid has a lot of ear infections, if they hear something incorrectly, they'll say it incorrectly, they'll read it. I mean, it all starts when they're super little. 
So that could be a reason why that they've created this neural pathway um, to saying the word wrong or the sound wrong. Now, let's also talk about the converse where we have kids who are not readers, but are like vacuum cleaners in the world. And they pick up every word they have ever yes. heard. I and have they use context clues to figure out the, the meaning of that word. Yes. And we see that frequently for our non-readers. And you will ask them this bizarre question and they'll like give you a dissertation on it, right? But they and have no so, idea what the sounds are inside of that word. They may, not, they may not be able to segment the word. They may not be able to decode the word. They may not can't be able to it. spell the word. Can't read it, can't write it. They can know the meaning. And you and I frequently have this where a word comes up and I'm like, oh, I think it means da, da, da. And you're like, how would you know that, Cindy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a, a, a gift, you know, a gift in, a, in certain yes. ways. It can be a gift in certain ways. It yeah. would be helpful if I could read and spell all of them, but such is life. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of vocabulary. Now let's talk about similarities. Do you remember the similarities test? I think you're asking, um, you know, how is a brush like a um, broom or something? Yes. Okay. So we give you two items and we ask you to explain the relationship between them. And initially it starts off with what we call being very concrete. Like it's very obvious. So like if I said scissors and a knife, you would say, well, they both cut. Right. Okay. And just like in vocabulary, we have responses that if you give a response, it's got a cue after it. You're supposed to query and say, tell me more about that to see if the kid can expand upon that and give more depth to their understanding. Now, this is another place where um, I often see kids where we'll say, tell me more about that. And they will tell me more about the answer that they just gave me mm. without it giving new information about their understanding of it. So let's go back to in what way are a knife and scissors alike. And let's say you said metal. And I said, tell me more about that. And the kid would say, well, there's metal in the in both blades. A oh. knife has metal and scissors have metal, mm. which is not improving the quality of the response. You're just explaining the answer that you gave me, which doesn't then explain the relationship better. Let's say a two point response or the most point response would be they're both used to cut objects. And metal gets you a query if you don't go into that blade is used to, there's metal in them and the metal is used to create a cut, then you wouldn't get the points. Well, and it's also very literal, which a lot of kids with dyslexia happen to be sometimes. But is it also difficulty with abstract thinking going to a different, it, going higher up in the category level? Is that right? Yeah. And and there's a whole thing on Bloom's taxonomy, which you can go in and dig into it another time, which is understanding different levels of complexity, mm -hmm. um, but it starts off. So the similarities test starts with very concrete objects, kind of like the one that we use with knife and scissors. And then it gets more and more and more abstract. And many of the kids, when they get to higher items would say, there's no relationship, there are opposites. And- Time tests or not? Untimed. Mm -hmm. And when a kid says that, I will just sit and wait because saying their opposites doesn't get a query. Like if you say, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of uh, something that would be opposite. Oh. Plus and minus. Mm -hmm. If you said those are opposite. Yeah. Kind of sit there and try and give you time to think about and try and determine a relationship that goes beyond their opposites because their opposites doesn't tell me how they're alike. Okay, one more weird question. Many if, more weird questions for me. Yeah, please. If, uh, if a kid has trouble with visualization, which a lot of our kids do, they don't see the words, they don't see the little letter. I see the letters, I see the pictures. If they don't see the picture of the word and they don't see the letters, doesn't that make- Or they can't visualize whatever it is. They can't visualize. Doesn't that make this a very difficult exercise? It depends on the kids. Yes, some kids won't be able to mentally think about or think through relationships. 
Um, I will also have kids tell me that the words begin with the same letter. They end with the same letter. Again, you're not telling me how the words or the concepts are related. Okay. And so uh, at that point, that's telling us something is going on there in the way the kid thinks and the way the kid that expresses what they're understanding. And that normally means we need to dig more. Like, so if that part, yeah, that, this is very important. So this verbal comprehension um, score could indicate a very, very variety of different things that we haven't looked at. That now, are let's talk about kids that score very high on similarities. Hmm. These are the kids that I don't want to overgeneralize. These typically are kids that can make great verbal arguments or they understand deep concepts or they understand relationships. There's a lot of depth and breadth to what's going on there. So even though they may not show that in their writing or even they, though they may not show that in um, reading. other ways in reading, yes. they can have depth and breadth in their understanding that indicates that they need intellectual challenge, that they need to be asked to think deeper, express more ideas, explore, and can get bored very easily when it's just kind of straightforward, A plus B equals C. It is quite fascinating when you get someone very sophisticated in this, you know, you know, but then they can't, they have difficulty with reading and writing, but they can listen to podcasts, absorb the concepts and repeat the words. It's yes. Crazy. It's crazy. So, um, and we'll do another uh, video on this later, but there's two additional comprehension subtests. There's information and comprehension, which is about understanding social rules. Mm -hmm. And you can actually administer all four and get a comprehensive verbal index score, which mm -hmm. very few clinicians do but it can also help paint another picture of how the student is performing and what it means in their skill set. So you could actually go and get additional, those additional subtests elsewhere. You can dive deeper and know more. There's always more to know. Okay. All right.